Moving with the technology. How to get to market quickly. Okay, so I am now inter well, introducing myself. I am moderating this panel. So we're looking at um, moving with the technology in particular. I, you know, I want to address how bootstrapping and, and kind of young, agile companies can make an impact faster in this space than the large behemoths. So I'd like to join, ask the panelists to come to the stage. So Michael and Kevin, would you like to join? Okay, so um, I'll, I'll start, like, do you want to each say a quick hello and introduce? Hello, hello. Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Michael, I'm one of the partners at Metaverse Architects. Metaverse Architects is a leading development and 3D studi studio. Primarily we build on Decentraland, but we also build on other spaces and private spaces. I'll leave it to, to Kevin now. Let's go. We got a packed house for the, one of the last uh, panel sessions of the day, but we're going we're gonna to bring the energy no matter what. So that's what I'm talking about. Uh, Kevin Soltani from Mintrist. I'm communications officer there. Uh, we pride ourselves as being one of the most secure, newest uh, protocols in the DeFi space. Uh, very excited to be here. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the investment side, but the growth. And I think that we all have a lot to add here. Uh, Given the crypto winter, given all the headaches, given everything, you still got to crush it. You still got to go forward every day. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, my name is Shrez Ahmed, coming from Switzerland. Uh, I'm the managing partner of Storm Partners and also the co-executive director of the Crypto Valley Association. So yeah, looking forward to the panel. Okay, brilliant. So that's everybody introduced. I am Aideen Short, and I have been here for the last two days, so you should probably know me by now. Okay, so Kevin, I'm going to start with you. So you've just had a very successful um, private launch with Mintrust. Um, why, why, and, and I, I'll come to you after that, Michael, about you, especially about your new your, your new offices here and the expansion. But why does it, uh, you know, why can a company like Mintrust and any other, you know, new agile, you know, hungry company? What do you have that the big companies don't? Why can you? get out there faster? So I think we reverse engineered the process of raising capital, uh, connecting with the community, uh, working with them in tandem. So most people go after a, a subset of investors that they feel they can close the round with, a subset of community members that they feel can join the network. What we did is we didn't close the ticket size to any specific number. The average ticket size was about 250,000, uh, which is average in DeFi, that's quite low give or take, you know, it depends who you compare it to. But what we did that, uh, instead of going after 5, 10, 15, we went after 50 to 100. And most of those had put in that average ticket size for the purpose of a great new protocol. And what that equated to was building the community at the same time. Not only are those investors, are those VCs bringing in their networks, right? We're also gaining the trust over the last year, year and a half. No one's perfect. We've had to push back deadlines. We've had to push back, uh, you know, we've had five security audits, much more than a lot of our competitors. So growing the investor network, getting the money in and the community at the same time, to be honest, kind of in the long run saved us a lot of money, not just going after community alone, which is a science in and of itself. So working with those two in tandem was a successful uh, for us and our private launch just happened about 10 days ago. Uh, we're happy to say about 5.2 million in TVL in the first five days. And we're kicking and screaming with zero marketing. Not a single dollar of marketing has gone out just yet. And okay. public is coming up soon. I can see I can see nodding. You're in agreement? Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think from when we're talking about like the bigger companies, what do they uh, don't have or what do they have and compared to what like the startups do, I definitely say that use the metaphor of like a big cruise ship, right? I mean, if a cruise ship wants to turn 90 degrees, it's going to take them much longer than it would for a speedboat. So I think startups do have that versatility. They do have the ability to be able to move faster, especially, for example, what just happened with USDC over the weekend. For example, BlackRock or another larger entity can't divest from USDC and be like, okay, maybe there's some issues with Circle. We're going to go and use, let's say, maybe USDT or something like this. They've made, let's say, board level decisions that they're going to commit to Circle. They can't switch like that. Whereas a startup can easily be like, okay, look, t 
today it no longer makes sense to use USDC, which I actually don't personally believe, but let's use it just as, a, as an example here. Um, we can switch one day to the next to USDT and not take that risk of what could happen in the interim period. Okay, and I see you nodding as well. What are your thoughts from Metaverse Architect point of view? I mean, I would say our main strength is the fact that our team is very young. We have an average age of around 24, Hobby. therefore, yeah. I was gonna swear again. <laughs> really? Yeah, oh my God, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, we grew up in a generation where we're, most of them are playing Minecraft, etc. And this passion has turned into a sort of business. I mean, I remember a year and a half ago, we were all in one of my partner's flat and all building the business, and it was very exciting. And this transition has led to where we are today. Yeah, because I know I, one, of your, one of your partners is like, I, I, I was talking to him about ChatGPT, and I got to the point where he was actually asking strangers on the street. I was like, okay, you know, you really have, you know, gone. And I, I can't imagine the passion in such a big organization. Such a passion in a big organization in terms yes, of that, that, that somebody's going to you know take their job and go out on the street and ask strangers what do you think of ChatGPT? Um, yeah, I mean, look, ChatGPT four just came out, right? I think it's definitely going to revolutionize a lot of businesses. I was actually speaking with some uh, C-suite uh, members yesterday. I was like, do you really use ChatGPT? Because so many people are talking about it. People are like, oh, I wrote my. Uh, email apology uh, or resignation letter uh, via ChatGBT. Then I was thinking like, okay, because me as a CEO of my business, I work with people. I don't necessarily do a lot of emails, which are kind of, let's say, content heavy. They're quite quick communications. And I was really asking them, like, I haven't used it practically speaking for the time being with regards to what I do. Our teams do, so our lawyers do, our marketers do. They use all types of tools. But for me, communicating with them, it would feel very, uh, yeah, unpersonal for me to kind of speak with my team, my close team like that. So I think it's definitely going to revolutionize a lot of things. For my specific, let's say, day to day, I still haven't found the, 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 the use case for it. But let, let, let's see. I haven't tested uh, ChatGPT4, but I'd love for somebody to be able to convince me Actually, otherwise. Okay, so I'm going to throw this to you because I know within days of, you know, the original launch, your company had a brand new a brand new product and like that kind of goes to what we're saying here is you I can't ever imagine, you know, a, a larger company, a larger entity getting going, okay, I'm going to do this. Here you go. So Yeah, I mean, the speed at which we're building new products is crazy. Last year, it would take us, even for a small product, to increase revenue, maybe a month, a month, five weeks. The last product we created under the, under the company took us 24 hours to build the website, the content, and to get customers on board. And this is all due to ChatGPT. Yeah. All. Yeah. So it's phenomenal. We're using it everywhere. Everywhere. And so that, that's, one, that, that's one of the things, I guess, that you can just, if you are able to look beyond kind of the, you know, the, the rules and the regulations within your company, you can move quicker. Um, going back to you, Kevin, I mean, with Mintrust, I mean, you have, I, I think, versus other sectors, because you're in DeFi, because you're, you know, there's a certain level of expectation, and I'm not going to use the word regulation to certain, like you had security audits. I mean, you know, you wouldn't get a product live in 24 hours if you had five security audits. So how can you, given that you're, you're subject to the same kind of onerous kind of, you know, checks that, that you know, that quick, you know, quick uh, products aren't, how, how, what's the advantage you have over other companies? You know, it's... DeFi is a very tricky one because just, what was it, three days ago, Euler was hacked for 200 million, 150 million, if I'm not mistaken. Super sad, uh, just another one in the bucket. But if you look at, it's not all their fault, as we always say, but they ran security audits. They did their best, but there's always something, there's a hole that they're going to find. This is why we just completed our fifth security audit, right? We have a, dil a due diligence not only to ourselves, but to our clients, to our customers, to the retail, to the investors all encompassing that they're looking for the best, safest, secure place to place their money. In the old days, that's what the bank provided you, right? <laughs> As of this weekend, that whole thing fell apart. But they used to say, run to the banks for secure money. And now they're saying, run to crypto in some essences for secure money. We kind of modeled ourselves after the bigger boys in the room of DeFi. They've done a really great job. I'm not going to, uh, you know, 
hurt my competition and say that we're after them, but Aave and Compound, they've done a great job at the security layers. We followed that kind of traction on security, where we feel we're a little bit better is that we capture the fees where they don't and redistribute them back to our uh, token holders. This will also increase the uh, TVL, I'm sorry, as TVL increases, so does the token value. If you do look at those other two, that's not true. Market caps, TVLs will go up as sometimes token value will come down. Well, that's just not uh, fair to the future client of DeFi who very, very little uh, education is happening in DeFi as well. So we're providing a few of those and I knocked off you know, security, I knocked off com competitors, capturing fees, but also it's the education, right? If you can educate people within DeFi, you'll understand why the security layers are so important. You'll understand why capturing fees and increasing your token value is so important. And so, yeah, I'll go back to the security layer. We're proud of that, we're happy, and uh, we feel just that much more secure for the retail investor, let alone the actual investor. Yeah, but, I, but sorry. No, I was just gonna say, I mean, we talk often about the benefits of innovation, uh, but there's also the side of um, putting into chat GBT, uh, find the vulnerability in this code, right? And then uh, you're always playing this kind of cat and mouse game of, okay, is your protocol secure enough to kind of face that level of AI and being able to find vulnerabilities, because of course, if you can find business opportunities, there's always the other side. And I think when we look at the news today, they're not really speaking too much about all of the vulnerabilities that there could be within the banking system, within anything that uses data and tech today. So I think it's definitely a light that should be shining. Okay, so going on to the, you know, that leads on to a, a very interesting question, which is um, done is better than perfect. And that's, you know, that's a luxury that kind of smaller companies and innovators and entrepreneurs can do that, you know, that uh, hosts of legal, you know, legal and marketing and, you know, in, in larger companies, not stifle innovation, but slow it down because they have a bigger stuff to lose. So where are you on that? All of you are nodding. So I'd love to hear all of your opinions. Done is better than perfect. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, in terms of does the startup model work at scale, right? Would you do the same thing if you had 2 million TVL, if you had 200 million, right? I mean, and it's also one of those things, yeah, you can be very agile, cost efficient, use the 80-20 Pareto's rule. But when you look at the larger companies, they can't, right? So it's also when you're scaling out your models, understanding, okay, at what point are we going to have a higher like OPEX or CAPEX based on the fact that we're bigger and we need to take more insurance risks on various different, uh, different layers. So maybe it's then easier to have segregated pools, for example, in DeFi where you just have a certain amount and your risk is essentially hedged. But I think it's very important to know as you scale, the risk becomes definitely higher and putting in more and more capital to make sure that that risk is, yeah, there's, there's not that premium there, it becomes more and more difficult. Yeah, because, I mean, Michael, with your, you know, when you're talking about putting products out in 24 hours and stuff like that, I mean, you surely have to, I mean, it's not, I'm, I'm, I'm unless you're unique in this world, I mean, I'm, there's bugs and there's things you've got to fix and go back. So clearly you work on the principle, get it out, and as long as it's almost there, we'll, we'll figure it out. Yeah, I mean, we work on the MVP principle, right? If we start seeing that it's generating slight amount of revenue from an SEO perspective it's done better than other products we can compare it to the first business we created we would then put more attention into it right we're in a very fast moving industry and uh, I think the more products we can scale out the bigger chance of that product helping increase the value of the, the main business Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go on to you know a, a touchy subject. So the Silicon Valley Bank. I mean, it's like I saw an article today uh, or yesterday that just said you know the collapse of SVP is you know is destroyed Web3. Now that's just absolute cack. I mean, you're not gonna you're not going to destroy the inevitable. But one thing you know one thing that I, I just think is is does you know right? It's not good. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to even, you know, go there in terms of, of the, the effect. This isn't the conversation. But one thing that I think this has highlighted is that innovation is not just literally in Silicon Valley. And I know lots of platforms and stuff are there that are hugely important. But, you know, we're here. You've just set up in Dubai yourself. And I think, I think this is highlighting that, you know, that, you know, it's put a spotlight on the fact that there is entrepreneurship and there is actually a lot of smart people doing a lot of smart things around the world yeah I mean that's I'm smart I'm <laughs> <laughs> that's 
that's guaranteed. It's just a pity that the greed of certain people or the regulations stifle the innovation in this sense. I mean, the biggest risk, in my opinion, for our industry due to the collapse is the fact that the bank would invest in companies like us that take an equity percentage and they say, listen, but if you, we're going to invest cash into you, you have to keep the money in our bank. So that is, that is where we would struggle or we would hypothetically struggle if we had to be in that position. Luckily, we're not, but yeah. yeah. No, so you're, you're nodding as well, go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, off of his last point and now this last point, it's all about the pivot, right? In, in any sense of the word, if your bank goes down and you're highly over leveraged to that, you know, the only choice you have now is to figure out a pivot whether that's to scale back, scale forward, fa fail fast, fail forward, all these cliche, you know, valley talk, it's, it's facts, it works, right? You do, you do have to pivot. And I'd say smaller, you know, SME companies in the blockchain crypto space have that, uh, you know, can afford to pivot, right? Can afford and should well, be ready at any it, moment, especially you in invest in people. Hacks. You know, you invest in people because it's like what you start out doing is very rarely what you end up doing. It's like, and it is about that. So, you know, so again, that's where kind of a smaller, fresher company, especially a young one, like you're like, you know, it's still playing Minecraft and stuff like that. It's like, you know, if your average age is 24, you're more flexible than a company that has seven, you know, HR departments and legal departments and, you know, and, and, and a playbook that governs what can and can't be done. Um, we have run out of time. It doesn't need any questions. So I, I have one last one then be, be, uh, before we go on. And so um, with, regards to, with regards to the, um, the, you know, the innovation versus the kind of larger companies, a lot of companies, a lot of the larger companies, happy to hang back and buy their way in. How do you feel about that? It's like, so they're, you know, they're, they're, they're happy for, you know, well, of course, you know, but, the, but like, you, you know, the innovator is all of the risk has been taken. Uh, you know, and then they're just going to go, okay, see which ones are left in a year's time. Uh, you know, is that is good, bad, indifferent? I mean, personally, there's not much to think about. It's just the way the capitalist system works. Yeah. It's adapt or die. The founders who want to keep the company and really have a passion, stay in it for the long run, right? Regardless of any potential investment in the future. I mean, look, in DeFi specifically, uh, the banks are coming. They're going to offer a solution in some sense of the word. You can call it uh, CDFI, which is centralized decentralized financing. Uh, but when they offer my mother a solution to move her money from her savings account, which used to be in America, a certificate of deposit that could be 5 10%, and they give her some other solution of 10 15% to compete with DeFi, which are hundreds of percents potentially, Chase Bank will win that fight, right? Not now, we're not even close. Regulations need to come in, a lot needs to happen on innovation, but we're headed that direction. You could call it via CDB, uh, CBDC, or you could call it a Chase token. I'm not gonna make that prediction. However, I know they're coming, and their security audits, their everything is gonna be 10 XRs, but they're gonna be in the shadows for now. So yeah. that's a little yeah, bit of how the, they, they hang back. Okay, I have literally, he's on the phone now, but he has actually warned me to, to stop talking. Um, so thank you very much. That was very interesting. And, um, and you know, Michael, good luck with the, with the new offices here in Dubai and, and congratulations on your launch. And thank you very much to, to Shisha. Thank you very much. Thank you guys, thanks for coming. Thanks everybody. Thanks.